Two years ago, I was in Haiti with Jeff, and he explained to me how they feed the children. That when you and I give, it buys little packs called mana packs of rice. All the vegetables, all the nutrients are in there, and that one pack contains enough for that child for that day. You can feed a child for $10 a month. A month. I want to encourage you. Maybe you're touched and you, you just sense the Spirit telling you to give to this. You still have the offering envelope. It's still in your control. Feel free to do that. Maybe you didn't come prepared. Take it home. Be a part of that. You're going to hear some awesome stuff today. Welcome to the stage here at Creekside Church. Jeff Swaim, Executive Director of Convoy of Hope. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, buddy. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Thank you for all you're doing through Convoy of Hope. You don't give money to Convoy, you give money through Convoy to meet needs. And thank you, Pastor Don, for your leadership and this expression of compassion year after year, week after week with this five bucks a visitor thing. What a great idea! You know what? Every two visitors, we can feed a kid that month. Isn't that cool? That's pretty good. Yeah. Thanks for letting me mess up your church today. I like this place. Man, if I lived out here, I'd show up here every Sunday. <laughs> and I wouldn't have to preach either. I'd just show up. It's good. Thank you for all you're doing uh, through Convoy and, and getting other leaders involved. Uh, I have a saying. I've been saying for 11 years. I've been at Convoy 12 years. But friends will give you money, but friends who love you bring their friends. And that's what your pastor's doing. He loves Convoy, so he's bringing his buddies. I appreciate that so much. Because of you and churches like you, just, just people like you, Convoy of Hope is exploding. When I jo joined Convoy of Hope 12 years ago, they had uh, ministered to 2.3 million people in eight years. But because of a pastor, it's just a local pastor who wanted to help Convoy, um, he had an idea. He didn't have money in his general fund or his missions fund to help convoy significantly. But he thought, what if I could get my people to give a day's pay? And we'll call it one day to feed the world. And he, he had the idea on a Wednesday morning in his prayer time. He calls me up, send me some videos, whatever you have. I'll use it. Whatever it is about, whatever it's, if it says convoy of hope, I'll use it. So I sent him the videos, and he started the idea of one day to feed the world. He challenged his people over the uh, three-week period of time, and they started giving offerings. He took the offerings uh, for three weeks because he was kind of figuring out his people. They didn't show up every Sunday. So you know how that is. So uh, over three weeks' time, his congregation of 125 adults gave $22,700. Now, that's a lot of dollars. There, wasn't, um, there weren't a lot of big checks, but it was 100% involvement. Parents were teaching their children to be generous. They took a portion of their allowance, and they gave. And they made it a family-wide, church-wide expression of love. So we took a hold of Ken's idea, and we started uh, implanting that vision within pastors to train people to live a generous, ridiculously radical, generous life of giving one day of their life. And as a result, Convoy of Hope has been able to expand its ministry. You saw last year we ministered to 7,990,000 people. Well, that's multiple times of what we had done in eight years history. We did it in one year. This last month, we surpassed 70 million people that we have ministered to. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> and we do that ministry in a number of ways. We do disaster response, disaster relief. We do tornadoes, fires, floods, wars. And uh, we, we do typhoons, earthquakes, tsunamis. It's remarkable when you start responding to people in their most difficult times and difficult needs, you start responding to them through other believers in their community. 
It's amazing how much of a response people will have to the love of Jesus. So when you help Convoy, we're helping churches around the world help their neighbors. It's not about Convoy. It's about the local church and its ministry of love. And, and, and it's the love of Jesus that they're trying to ex- express. And people are coming to know Jesus by the hundreds, by the thousands, when we do these outreaches at disasters. It's remarkable. Currently, we're working in East and West Africa. There's famines going on there, major droughts. We're working in Hurricane Sandy, New York, New Jersey. We're working in uh, Moore, Oklahoma, and Joplin, Oklahoma. Devastating tornadoes there. Of course, we're working in Haiti. We were working in Haiti prior to the earthquake on January 12, 2010. We were feeding 11,000 kids a day there. Now we're feeding 89,000 kids a day in Haiti through over 350 schools and about 60 to 70 orphanages. The number keeps increasing. When I took Pastor Don down there, I believe we were feeding about 32,000 kids. Now we're up to 89,000 kids there. And I'll get back to Haiti, but we're currently working in Japan as well as the Philippines regarding the disasters there, the typhoon in the Philippines and also the earthquake in Japan three years ago. We're still there. And uh, we're responding to floods and tornadoes in the Midwest. It seems like we live right around disaster, the bullseye. (laughs) We live in Springfield, Missouri. Our headquarters is there. But we have warehouses around the world, especially where we feed kids in 11 different countries. We have a children's feeding initiative. You saw the number, 145,000. That's increased to 147,000 since the video was made. And we have approved on the list... 100,000 more kids that will be added to the feeding initiative as resources come available. Food as well as finances to get the free food that's donated to us. And it takes money to go get the free stuff and send it overseas. And so you be praying with us how you can help with that through One Day to Feed the World, our new program that's called Feed One. Mother Teresa challenged Hal Donaldson on our, our video, our president, when he interviewed her for a magazine article, he is a journalist, and uh, she challenged him, if you can't feed 100 kids, at least feed one. And so Hal took that, and he came home from a road trip one time, and he said, what if we could get, do the math and how much it costs us to feed a kid on average around the world in the countries that we serve? And we landed on the average amount it takes per month is 10 bucks a month. That's a pretty good number. You know what? That's three cups of coffee at Starbucks, right? I mean, if you go out for... Oh, maybe two. Okay. All right. What am I thinking? <laughs> I just get espresso. <laughs> That'll be eight shots. Well, I guess that's two. <laughs> or like going out for lunch today, a family of four ordering a soft drink at lunch, you know, One meal, soft drinks, that's a kid. You know, you start doing the math like that, it'll be easy to come up with 10 bucks. And we're finding the junior hires and high schoolers and anybody can do one kid. One businessman in Fresno got so challenged to his heart, he's doing 1,000 kids a month. Isn't that exciting? And you know what? God's blessing his business, and uh, he's a generous man, very generous. Gives a lot through his church to do missions work. Well, this feeding initiative, it is exploding for Convoy of Hope. We're adding some countries next year, but we're adding kids. We've got 100,000 kids on that wait list. Here's what happens. Uh, Why we got involved with the feeding initiative. About seven or eight years ago, we noticed in Haiti, we had responded to multiple disasters there. They were hit with, with hurricanes one after another, three in a row one year. Uh, week after week. It was, it was just amazing. Devastated uh, the country. In fact, we also responded to Cuba that year. We were the first non-government organization to go into Cuba since 1959. We responded there. We had to get permission from the Cuban government as well as the U.S. State Department. And about three weeks later, the Catholic Charities were able to come in as well. But uh, as a result, it has opened up the window for Convoy of Hope to respond to Haiti, uh, as well as Cuba. Well, we noticed in Haiti that kids were skipping school in order to panhandle or beg for money in order to buy 
food to eat that day. They weren't thinking about their future. They were thinking about, what am I going to eat today? And so we said, you know what? We can fix this. So we found partners down there that had schools that were attached to churches. In other words, the church ran the school or the church had an orphanage. And so we went with those models because we wanted not only kids to get fed, but to come to know Christ and that their hope would be in Christ and they would be an amazing leader and believer in their nation. And so we started there, and it's amazing what has happened. Um, Pastor Don, you and I went, and we went to a school probably, and we dished up some food on some pans. Okay, I'm telling you, the, the plates that we give these kids, it's more than you and I can eat in one sitting. It's, it's, I mean, it's big. I mean, there's no way I could eat all what those kids are given. And to the kid, you'll see them taking food, stuffing it in their pockets or a backpack. Why? They're taking food home to a little brother or sister who's not in school or maybe even their mother. And it's amazing. It, it touches my heart every time I go down there because these kids who have the least are the least selfish. They're selfless. They give and they give. And their job, as they see it, is to go to school and bring home the bacon, as it were, the, the rice and beans. But also, they're learning. And right now, our philosophy is that we're going to feed these kids. But if we do our job right, we're not going to be feeding their grandkids. We're working ourselves out of a job. And we have an amazing addition to our team. Three years ago, uh, God gave us a pastor out of Washington State. His name is Jason Struble. He felt prompted to go back to school and get a PhD in soil science at Washington State. He got his PhD. We call him Dr. Dirt. <laughs> so Dr. Dirt has gone to Haiti and he is transforming that nation. It's amazing the network that he has created and a co-op. He's trained over 3,500 farmers in Haiti how to use their soil properly. He's partnered with 800 of them in our partnership of, of Haiti One. And we are helping these farmers increase their crop yields. A majority of them have seen a 100% increase in crop yield. Some have seen a 300% increase in crop yield. And we also are purchasing food back from them. You saw in 2013, 1.2 million meals grown in Haiti for the feeding initiative. That's a big deal. And as of June 1st, we had 1.3 million meals since January 1st to June 1st. They already exceeded last year's total. And so what we're hoping to see happen is we're stimulating the economy down there and they're feeding their own. And 800 of these farmers are donating 10% of their crop back to the feeding program. So we're, they're feeding their own kids. And that's what we're seeing happen right there in Haiti. And Jason is taking the, the idea and, of soil and conservation and, and rotating crops. He's taking it to Ethiopia and Tanzania. And he's also taking it to Detroit, which is another foreign country. <laughs> and <laughs> it's amazing what has happened there. The city fathers as well as the pastors of the inner city have come together. There's acres and acres of vacant lots that have been turned into community gardens this summer. Dr. Dirt has led the charge. Pretty exciting. We also have a program that's mentioned in the, in the video where uh, women from really depressed, oppressed situations in countries around the world. We started this in Ethiopia and the poorest of the poor neighborhoods, where women are treated like animals, we have lifted them up. They made anywhere from 11 to $15 a month, and on average they had four or five kids, and they were poor. I mean poor. They came to this school, called, we call it women's empowerment. They learned a trade, learned how to run a business. We, we seeded their business. Each one of them got $250 from Convoy of Hope. They didn't have to pay it back. We got them a, a, a moratorium on paying taxes for two years and taught them how to save money back so the taxes won't break their business. But they're ready to start doing that. And they picked different businesses. 
And they've actually hired other women to work for them. And the business owners are paying their employees the same as what they make. That's selfless. And we offered these women food for their children. And they said, no, thank you. We can feed our own kids. You know what? We're working ourselves out of a job there too. We're feeding 9,000 people because of that initiative. And we're not even shipping food over there. Where they're providing their own groceries through the job that they now have and business they're now having. It's, it's awesome. And we also have community outreaches in Europe, here in the United States. We have one in Tacoma in the near future, as well as Coeur d'Alene in the near future. And hopefully next year we'll be in the Tri-Cities area in the middle of Washington State. What happens at a community outreach? People come and they get exposed to people just like you who are serving at this outreach and they've been working for weeks on it and coordinating efforts of government agencies, businesses, and churches coming together to help their neighbors. Anywhere from 800 people will be a guest of honor. Up to 15,000 people will have volunteers and the thousands of people, depending on the size of the outreach. It is absolutely exciting. I met a guy in Concord, California, which is East Bay, San Francisco area, and I went to this outreach about three or four years ago, and it was so exciting to see. <clears throat> there were all kinds of things going on for kids, and I met this guy. He was coming across the lawn. He was about six foot six, African-American guy, and I was tiny compared to him. He reached out his paw, and he said, hi, my name's Ron. Hi, my name's Jeff. And uh, he said, today's my anniversary. I said, oh, you and your wife got married on this day? No, I came to this outreach a year ago. I came to prove that nobody would give away 40,000 pounds of groceries, let alone Christians. I didn't think they had it in them. But I came, and I had lunch three times, and... Uh, I, I saw my neighbors having fun. The kids were having a blast. And we walked away with three, two or three bags of groceries. And I was made to feel special, like I was a guest of honor. It was amazing. I said, well, did you come to know Jesus that day? No, I didn't. But somebody invited me to a men's breakfast. And so I went to a church up the hill. I went up there, had some burnt pancakes. And I asked Jesus Christ in my heart. And they gave me a job to do. I'm a greeter. And I'm thinking, bouncer? <laughs> and I said, Ron, did you have a church background before that? He said, no, I was a Muslim. And it really, really touched my heart that people loved me and accepted me just the way I was. And that meant a lot to me. It's amazing when you give a demonstration of God's love how open people are to a presentation of God's love. Ron was touched because people were, were like Jesus with skin on. And I want to thank you for all you're doing through Convoy of Hope. It's amazing. I'm going to hurry up here. I've got a message to share with you. I've got a verse to share with you. Sometimes when we're reading along in the Bible, there'll be a verse and we think, man, Jesus didn't mean to say that. That's like horseradish. It's really strong and has a bite. Well, I'm going to share one of those verses. It's a shock and awe verse. Maybe you've read it before, and you kind of skimmed right by it. I wonder what he meant by that. Well, we're going to find out. In uh, Luke 14, let's read it together. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Okay. To be a disciple, we got to go home and be a grouch. No problem. We got that going on at our house. <laughs> no, you have to remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the Jewish community. They loved each other. They loved their mom and dad, brothers and sisters, wife and kids. He knew that. They knew he knew that. Jesus was drawing a comparison. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, your love for me must be supreme. In other words, you got your love for your family compared to your love for me. It's like hate compared to your love for me. It's that intense, that passionate. I shared this principle with our youth workers in Albany, Oregon, where I was a youth pastor. And there was this one youth worker that said, 
God doesn't expect us to love him more than our family. There's no way. I said, yes way. In fact, if you love God more than you love your family, your family will receive so much more love from you. She said, right. (laughs) She didn't get it. But I was in my natural pose, holding a cup of coffee. I said, you know how much I like coffee, right? Yeah, you're an addict. (laughs) I gave her that one. Um, I said, I wouldn't use a dirty cup, would I, if I was going to drink coffee? No, you wash out the cup. Okay, I wash out the cup. I fill the cup all the way to the top, and I'm holding that cup, and somebody comes along and bumps my arm. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to spill coffee all over yourself. That's right. The same thing happens in our life when we ask Jesus to come into our life. You say, Jesus, fill me with your love. That's not going to happen until we do what 1 John 9 says. 1 1 John 1 9. It says, if we confess our sins, the things we've messed up on, if we confess that to God, he is faithful and he's just. And he will forgive us of all those wrong things. And he'll wash us, cleanse us, purify us from all those unrighteous things. And he'll come in, he'll take up residence in us. But not until we ask him to come into our life will he, uh, and forgive us will he move in. He moves in and he begins to capture our life. Let me tell you, when you've had it, a great taste of coffee, your favorite beverage, or maybe an iced tea or a glass of water, and you've had a taste of it, and it's really good, you want some more, right? And when you've had a taste of Jesus, and it's real, and it's authentic, you want some more of him, right? The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you get hungry for Jesus, he's going to fill you up. In fact, the Bible says, if you want to come close to me, I'll come close to you. The closer you get to me, I'm going to get real close to you. You make the first move, I'm going to move to you. I tell you what, Jesus has made the first move. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us on the cross. He made the first move. Now it's our turn to respond and ask him into our life. And I'm telling you, if you get thirsty and hungry for Jesus, it's going to become so real. My message today is called a supreme love. That I would love God with a supreme love. That I love him more than anyone else or anything else in my life and even myself. I love him more. More. Tell you what. When you get a taste of Jesus and you get thirsty for him, it's like you're developing a hunger and thirst for him. That What will happen next is he'll begin to capture our heart, our affections, our desires, the things we're devoted to, that which we defend, our hurts of the past that causes us pain that people have maybe caused in our life. He'll capture our joys, our dreams, our aspirations. He'll capture our, what we're, we're, our schedule, our pocketbook. He'll capture the frustrations in our life. He'll capture us. What's really awesome, all the while, we're capturing him more and more of his heart. God, I want to be more like you. I want to love you more. And like my wife and I, when we started dating, wow, I just wanted to be around her all the time. I just thought about her all the time. And you know what? That's the kind of passion God wants in us that we're seeking to have company with him, a relationship with him, not some dead relic of a religion, but something real and vibrant, a relationship that's a friendship. Wow. And what happens if we become like David in the Old Testament, a person seeking after the very heart of God, what takes place is, is really amazing. The more passion we have for Jesus, the more compassion we will have for other people. Because we will no longer look at people through our eyes of humanity, which oftentimes we judge people. Well, there's a problem to be solved. We judge people. But through the eyes of Jesus, 
His eyes are blurred with tears of compassion. Through his eyes, we see people differently. We say, there's a person to be served. Wow. And we define love so amazingly. My mentor, Alan Groff, defined love as love is the accurate estimate and the adequate supply of another person's need. When you think about the life of Jesus, that was it. I'm going to say that again. Love is the accurate estimate and the adequate supply of another person's need. Tell you what, when you're full of Jesus, instead of reacting out of self or self-defense or because our feelings are hurt, or because somebody does something wrong, we don't react, we respond in love. We cushion the blow with love. It's amazing. This passion that compels us to be compassionate. Compassion is not merely feeling sorry for somebody, okay, which is sympathy. Compassion is not empathy, merely understanding someone's problem. Compassion is, is action, being moved to compassion to do something about someone's problem and meeting people at their point of need. It's remarkable. In fact, in verse 25, prior to verse 26, there was a great big crowd following Jesus around. Why? Because Jesus was moved with compassion, and he met needs around him. He healed the sick. He held them close. He turned a sack lunch into a smorgasbord one day. It was amazing. Tremendous. And I'll tell you what, people respond to compassion. This passion that's transformed into compassion affects those around us a great deal. My wife and I, we've been married 37 years next month, and we've never had a fight. <laughs> You're thinking, liar, liar, pants on fire, run for president? Well, <laughs> the neighbors have heard us talk. No, <laughs> sorry. No, seriously, uh, we've never had a fight, never yelled at each other, slammed doors, or whatever. Because I'm gone a lot. That helps. So, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so tell you what, I, I've always adored my wife. And we have two daughters. They're expensive. <clears throat> but all the time growing up, I didn't leave the love category just to my wife. Men, I want you to know something. We set the tone of how much love there is in the home. That's why Paul said, husbands love your wives. Husbands love your wives. It'll add so much security to your children. I'd be driving down the road with our daughters in the back seat. Guess what, guys? What? I love you. Ten minutes later, guess what, guys? You love us. <laughs> I didn't want to have them end up on Dr. Phil or anything. So <laughs> told them how much I loved them. And uh, I don't think they fully understood how much we love them. My youngest daughter has two kids. When we found out we were going to be grandparents, Kathy said, I'm going to go out and get some diapers. I said, you're not that old yet. So... Uh, <laughs> When kids were growing up, we had simple rules. Do what I say, but we had one rule. They couldn't ride with a friend who had their license less than six months. Stephanie broke the rule. She rode home with Jessica, who had her license two and a half months. And she saw Jessica driving. She said, Jessica, can I drive? Sure. Stephanie forgets to buckle up. Having never driven before, she doesn't know the difference between the brake and the gas. So she plants Jessica's car into a telephone pole on the corner of the street we live on, okay? So she sails over the steering wheel, breaks the windshield. They take her into the neighbor's kitchen, and I'm coming home, and people wave me down. I'm coming home to go golf with my brother-in-law. And people won't let me pass, as if I can drive through. There's a fire truck and an ambulance and even the pastor. So there was this... And I'm, I'm getting out of my car. Here comes my wife across the lawn. I said, what idiot drove the car up in the yard? Stephanie. Oh. So Stephanie heard that I was on the scene. My dad's here. He's going to kill me. 
And so uh, I go into the room. Daddy, Daddy, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. As if I'm going to kill her. I look around. Too many witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> so I take her to the hospital, and there we are in the emergency room. I said, Stephanie, I love you. I love you too, Daddy. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't think you get it. The rules we have at our house are there to protect you, not to destroy your life. Yet that's a perk I have as your dad. <laughs> I said, honey, I love you so much. I wish I could trade places with you. You do? Yeah, I do. Daddy, you got to know that. I mean, Stephanie, you got to know this. I love you so much. I would die for you. You would? Yeah, I would. Mom and dad, you love your kids that much, don't you? You would die for them. Better not. They're watching. (laughs) Think about that determined commitment for those you love the most. Now let's compare it to what Jesus wants us to do. Our most passionate love for those we love the most is like hate compared to our love for Jesus if we're going to be his disciple. The thing is, my wife and kids know that I am crazy in love with them, but they know that I love Jesus more. They're okay with that deal. Why? Because my wife gets a better husband out of that deal and my Kids get a better dad out of that deal. In my humanity, I do not have the capacity to love them like I want to love them or what they deserve or desire. But God working in me and through me, it's remarkable. This cup symbolizes our heart and mind. I'm telling you, you and I are so blessed with the love of God and the blessings we have. But I'm telling you, when you have a supreme love for Jesus, you're not just an object of God's blessing, just to hold it all in. But when you have a supreme love for Jesus, you not only become an object of God's blessing, you become an instrument of God's love. That God pours it in you and through you. In fact, when you're jarred by life's demands... You spill God's love on people. Isn't that remarkable? And I close with this. The greatest day in my life would be when my kids say, Dad, I love you, but I love Jesus more. (laughs) Mission accomplished. Because they will do things or not do things. Because they love Jesus. Not because I say so or because they'll disappoint me. Because they love Jesus. You know what that is? Holiness. Holiness. Not just adhering to a set of rules, but it's out of love, a supreme love and passion for Jesus that they'll do everything in their life, whatever it takes to please Jesus. Find out what pleases God. And I'm telling you, You're in the right direction if you're hungry and thirsty for Jesus. I want to challenge you. Have a supreme love for Jesus that creates a thirst and a hunger and intimacy, a friendship, a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful church. Amazing group of people here. You've brought everyone here today to hear this message of hope of love. And maybe there are those in this room that have struggled with relationships by how they've been loved or interpreted love. But I pray, Lord, that they would be flooded with your unconditional love today, that they would feel loved like never before. There are those like like me. I grew up without a dad. And you, Lord, became my father. You're a father to the fatherless. Amen. And those that are lacking in, in relationships and struggling with frustrations in life, I pray, Lord, that they would find an amazing, amazing friendship with you 
through a surrender to you and a desire for more of you. Help everyone in this room grow intimate with you as they have a supreme love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.